Let us pray. Our Father, we pray that you will speak to our hearts. We pray that the work you have given us to do, you will grant us the grace and the wisdom to do it effectively. Show us, Lord, the path we ought to follow, the things we ought to do, so that we will be able to receive a well done on the last day. In Jesus' name we pray. From Luke chapter 22, reading from verse 25. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that does serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you, as he that serveth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, From verse 26 to verse 28. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty and the base things of the world and things which are despised as God chosen ye and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. We're talking about kingdom life for leaders. The subject of leadership is a subject that the worldly people also get themselves concerned about and the church is also interested in the subject the reason for that is very clear in the world without some sort of leadership a lot of things that are done cannot be effectively done in our school system there is leadership in the construction business there is leadership in factory work, there is leadership. And in whatever you think about in the world, there is leadership. Then as you come into the church, you also know that there is leadership. But from the two passages I've read, both Jesus Christ and Paul emphasized that the church is different from the world. And Jesus specifically said in Luke chapter 22 verse 25, there is a leadership style in the world. And there is what they do in the kingdoms of the world. How the leaders rule, exercise authority, how they lead, how they guide their subjects. But Jesus said to the disciples that leadership style shall not be in the kingdom of God as it is in the world among the Gentiles. And then Paul the Apostle emphasized that to see your calling, brethren, that not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise after the flesh are called. If God had needed the leadership style of those wise, mighty, noble men in the world, he would have called them and placed them into leadership. But because God knew that the things in the kingdom of God are totally different. He has given his own children as well as his own servants the way they ought to live and the way that we ought to do the work he has given us to do. Here we need to correct a basic mistake in the Christian church at large, that is, in the various denominations and churches all over the world. 
generally all over the world if somebody has been a teacher in the world and he becomes converted without ever looking at qualifications or abilities or any other thing or we say he's a teacher in the world and since he's a teacher normally by calling and profession when you bring him to the church he ought to be a teacher but God may not give him the gift of teaching in the church. He may be a teacher in the world. At other times, we find that a man or a woman has been in leadership position out there in the world. And when he comes in, without being particularly equipped and qualified by the Spirit of God, we bring him to the church and we say he can do it. Because he's been leading in the company. He's been leading in the construction um, work and if he could lead in the construction work over there and we say it's the same thing he is leading people over there he's going to lead people over here put him there he can do it or sometimes you'll find some great politicians who have now resigned from politics now they, they are being converted and without they are getting any formal training or informal training in the church without following leadership in the church themselves to know what church leadership looks like, some people will bring them forward and say, well, if this man could lead a whole nation or a whole state or a whole local government area, now he's in the church, why can't we put him there when we know that this man from the world has always been a leader, so he can be a leader here? But the leadership styles are very, very different. And so we should not get into the same mistake that because somebody has been doing something in the world that looks similar to what we're doing in the church, that therefore he can do it. It's just like when we consider marriage. The worldly people get married. Christian people get married. And you know that there is a world of difference between a Christian family and the families of the people in the world. And sometimes it's the same basic mistake that we make that you grew up in a family yourself but the type of family in which you grew up wasn't um, a christian family and you felt that there was um, apparently peace in our home and there is the way my father used to do it and dealt with my mother and that i count as a model and now you are a christian and without knowing that there is difference the headship of the family in the world the way that headship or leadership was carried out when you were young is totally different from how you are to carry out the leadership and headship of your family now. You are a believer. There's a complete difference. But the mistake we make is that, well, I know how my father used to handle the issue, how my father used to control my mother, how my father used to guide and control the children, and therefore now as a believer, I take that as a model and even though you'll say your father wasn't uh, really born again or committed Christian, but he kept the house in order and he kept the home intact. So I can follow that and you'll experience total failure. Because the kingdoms of this world are totally different from the kingdoms of kingdom of God. Now in the church, when you are called into the leadership position, you need to begin to find out from the scriptures what's the kingdom lifestyle for the leaders. What are the things that the Lord is expecting? That a person that lives in the church will be able to go through. And you'll need to develop those qualities and know that if I develop these qualities that the Lord has shown in his word, I'll be able to lead effectively any area of leadership in which you may be in the church. It may be over a small group of people you need to watch how the scriptures will want you to behave, to relate, and to lead. Or it may be over a large group of people. The same thing you'll have to find out. In the scriptures we have, we have uh, seen some qualities or some things in the lifestyle of leadership. And the things that you will see. You will see that the priority of the leaders in the Bible is that they were obedient to the master plan of the master planner. Obedient to the master plan of the master planner. I'm reading from Exodus chapter 6, verse 22. 
Exodus 6, 22. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Chapter 7, verse 5. And Noah did according to unto all that the Lord had commanded him. As you read about Noah, and you see what God did with him, and how God instructed him, and the response of Noah to the word that God had spoken to him, some things immediately begin to strike you. One, look at the age of Noah. Before God called him, commissioned him, and gave him the assignment, the work he ought to do. In chapter 5, verse 32, And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. You see, in the way that human beings think, if they have added some years of experience to their life, and now they are old enough to say, I have experience in life, and I know what to do. When they are called of God, if they are not very careful, what they will do is that they will depend upon their years of experience. Because they will say, I'm not a young person anymore. When somebody who ought to be or is chosen to be a leader in the church begins to depend upon the experience that he has gathered all over the years, Already there is failure coming on the way for that individual. In Job chapter 32, Job chapter 32, verse 7, I said, days should speak, multitude of years should teach wisdom, but there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding, Great men are not always wise. Neither do the aged understand judgment. Now, if we understand the scriptures that have just been read, you understand that if we depend on days, on the number of years, on the experience you might have acquired because you have lived long on the earth, and you throw aside the word of God, you will discover that you will fail completely. How many people come into the church and perhaps they have been Christians before they came to the church and then they've been working in another church. Now they've come into the church and we've made them zonal leaders or area leaders or house fellowship leaders or another type of a worker in the church. And they do not take the Saturday workers meeting very seriously. Well, they say those young people, they need it, but I have experience. One, I'm not just a young boy or just a young lady. I've been married for a long time. I have children. I've been in this leadership position now for a long time. In the school system, I was inspector. In the home, I manage the children as well as the maids that live with me at different times. And in our church before, I was Sunday school teacher. And over there and over there, I've been called to leadership positions by the government, in my place of work, in the church, everywhere, name it, I've been there. Now that I'm in deeper life and I'm one of the leaders, I don't have to be coming to all these Saturday meetings because I don't really need it. All the things they will say there, what are they going to say on doing the work of God? Is it not to lead this house fellowship or is it not to lead in this area? I know everything already. Great men are not always wise. And the only thing that can make us successful is to become so humble and to come to the situation to say that I do not know what I think I ought to know. Now look at Noah. Noah that we're reading about had been 500 years of age and then the Lord called him. And the Lord began to tell him how to build the ark. Not only that, you must understand that in those days, many things are developed. They had developed a lot of professions. And all these professions that, de that they developed, Noah had access to them. If you read on your own later, chapter 4 and chapter 5 of Genesis, you'll see the technology that started developing at that time. And those two chapters speak a little on the professions 
the technology, and the things that were growing up and developing. And obviously Noah, at such an age, would be able to do a little reading and a little understanding of what goes on in building little boats, little ship, building things in the world. But now God called him and said, Noah, this assignment that I have for you, in chapter 6, verse 14, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shall thou make in the ark, shall, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. The danger for Noah will be at this time that if he got into any difficulty in the work, if you have been in construction work, you will understand. Like you are building a house, or you are building a vehicle, or you are building up something that deals with technology. Sometimes when you get to the middle of your work, you need to go back and look at the master plan. You need to understand again what were the instructions that I was given and what are the things that the uh, draftsmen and the architects have written down. But as Noah came into such difficulty, what should he do? Now if Noah was like the ordinary fellow today, they will go back to the engineering books of the day. Well, they say, I've talked to God. We don't have to be bothering God every time. How do you do this? How do you do this? I'll go back and check up. After all, there are a lot of books all around. Do you know that's what ruins Christian work? Instead of coming back to the blueprint, coming back to the word of God, so that at the end of the day, the testimony can be written about you. Does did brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. But instead, we go back to the books of the world. And you do that on your, in your marriage. When you get into a difficulty, what do you do? Instead of going back to the blueprint, to the one that instituted marriage originally, and going back to him and saying, this thing is complicated. I'm confused. I don't know what to do. I don't know how I'll come out of this. This marriage is hitting the rock. What should I do? And the master planner, the architect of marriage, the one that instituted marriage, would have been able to point you to his word and tell you that it doesn't matter. Those bones may be dry and scattered. I can collect them together and make a home once again. But we don't do that. We either go to an uncle, we go to a friend, or we go to the books, so or we say, I have a lot of books. When I got married, I gathered all those books. Anything I could find on marriage, I gather them. And I'm sure that in some of those books, I must find solution. That's the problem. Or when you come to the work of God, in the work of God, when you get stuck, you get into a difficulty. And instead of going back to the master plan and saying, what's the master plan? What has the master said about this work? Remember, the work of the church is the work of the Lord. Upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Instead of doing that, we go back to asking. Well, when we were in the Anglican church, this is the way we used to resolve that problem. In the Anglican church, were you sanctified? Were you baptized in the Holy Ghost? Were you looking for dust, says the Lord, every time you got into a problem in the Anglican church? And other people will say, well, I know the church I was before wasn't, we can't call it gospel church when I was in the celestial. But you know, we expanded and we built church everywhere. And uh, if it's just that we didn't have the full gospel. But uh, it's just because they did all that uh, candle burning and incense burning. But I was in the supreme council of that church. And there was a way we used to handle the problem. And they go back to celestial method. And they fail. You are disqualified. Instead of going back to God and saying, God, look at the difficulty I have on this work. How will I get through? What will I do? Instead of doing that, they go back to the carnal methods of the carnal people. Let's look at Moses. In Exodus chapter 40, verse 16. Thus did Moses, according to all that the Lord commanded him, so did he. Now you can see the same words were written about Moses that were written about Noah. Let me remind you again that for Moses, he wasn't an unintelligent man. He was one of those few people in the work of God 
that really were mighty and had been very, very learned. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, and verse 22, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and in deeds. Moses was learned. That means, if you explain that and break that down, he wasn't a novice, he wasn't an ignorant fellow, an unrefined, uncultured, untrained, uneducated fellow. That means he must have had some books. That means he must have had some training and teaching. But would you remember that when he did what he did prematurely, and he had to run away from Pharaoh, he ran away without carrying his load of books with him. He just went with the clothes on him because he was running for his dear life. And he was there for 40 years behind the des behind the, at the backside of the desert with Jethro, the father-in-law. Eventually, when the Lord called him, the only thing he saw in his hand was a staff, a rod. And said, Moses, what's that in your hand? And he said, it's a rod. And he says, I need you. Take your rod along. And then he came to Egypt. When he came to Egypt, there is no record that he went to the old library of books that he left behind 40 years ago. Couldn't find them. All he had now was a rod. And then whatever confusion came in his life, he went to God. He sorted everything out. And the Lord will call him. And when the Lord called him and will tell him, go to Pharaoh, go and do this and go and do this, all the wisdom he could depend upon was the wisdom communicated to him by God alone. And all through those years, and when they came back and they were now in the wilderness, walking through and going through to um, Canaan, you'll remember that he didn't have any time referring to all those books of the world. He learned something. That if you are going to please God, that you will have to depend upon God and God alone. In building the tabernacle, we've been studying in the church for a long time now. And all through these chapters, from chapter 25 to chapter 40, not something you realize is how God told this man what to do, as if this man was a non-entity, telling him how to make the rod, how to make the ark, don't you think that God should have assumed that in Egypt they were making pyramids? They were making a lot of things in Egypt because civilization started in Egypt very, very early. And the Egyptians started science much earlier than all the other kingdoms. In fact, Egypt was like an empire. And they had all the building techniques. Mathematics was well developed in Egypt much earlier than all the other nations. Medical science was much developed in their own way in Egypt, much earlier than all the other nations. And you talk about architecture. It was something that Egypt specialized in very, very early. And this man, Moses, was being trained and was given the greatest, the best education you could have in Egypt because Pharaoh's daughter had adopted the man, the young man, so that this man, Moses, will be a son to Pharaoh's daughter. And when he grew up, history tells us that he could have been a pharaoh himself. He could have been a king over Egypt. But he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God because he walked as if he had seen the invisible. Now, somebody who had been trained in the architecture of the world, in the building of the pyramids in Egypt, in the mathematics as well as the sciences of Egypt. Now, God wanted to build a temporary tabernacle that they could dismantle and then carry away with poles and badger skin, with purple and linen clothes, and then a chest that is a box where you just put the Ten Commandments and the mercy seat on it, and God had to give instruction for many chapters from chapter 25. And we'll say the ring will be like this, the rod will be like this, the pole will be like this, the wood will be like this. <laughs> Didn't Moses have any intelligence at all? You know, that's what some people say. Why do they call us together and tell us all these things? This is how to lead house fellowship. House fellowship of, 20, of uh, 10 people, 7 people, 12 people. 
What do they think we are? Well, if they have to teach all those other people, I know what to do. I know how to handle that. I can do that myself. No, you don't know how to do that yourself. This is the work of God. God has dealt with people wiser than we are. Long, long ago, you know how he dealt with them? He gave them all the details of what they ought to do. And Moses didn't say, you know when you are talking to some people, and you know they are not really willing to learn, and uh, you tell them, now, brother, you will do this work, this is what you, as you are describing what to do, he says, yes, I understand, I understand. He doesn't listen, because he knows everything. And you say, yes, I know you understand, but you see, you'll put this one, this, I, I know that. Then, when you put that one there, then you will go to, you'll do that first, after that, don't touch this one before you finish that. Then, I know that now, ah, brother, I'm not a little boy, I've been in this world for many years now. That's why they fail. They've been in this world for many years. And they cannot listen to instruction coming from above. They can't read the Bible. All those instructions to them, they are simple. Have you noticed whenever we are talking about marriage, uh, we did this year, and uh, we, had, we had a lot of people that didn't come. You know why they didn't come? Not that they are not interested in the subject, but they checked up at home the complete Bible study series. All the cases that, you know, they have accumulated and acquired from 1978. All the tracts. All deeper life material on marriage. Equa material on marriage. Assemblies of God material on marriage. Celestial material on marriage. Anglican material on marriage. The common prayer book on marriage. And everything. When they looked at everything, they say, Monday Bible say, what will they tell me in one hour? Look at my library here. I can lecture on marriage myself. They don't come. They know it all. And eventually, when they get married, problems that shouldn't bother anybody will put their back on the ground. And they say, me, why? With all the knowledge I have, you don't have any knowledge. What we need is to listen to the Lord. Do you see Moses? He paid attention. When God said, Moses, you'll build this, you'll build this, he paid attention. He didn't say, I have all that knowledge. And he kept to the word of God. And we are told, Moses did according to all that the Lord had commanded him, so did he. Now you know the danger when you have been an experienced person in life, an educated person in life. And for you, you say that these things are, you know, commonplace, I know how to do these things. When you are given instruction, now as you are given that instruction, you understand the instruction quite all right. Then you go away from the pastor who has given you the instruction and deliberately, this is not mistakenly, deliberately you adjust everything. You say in, that they say in the world that if they send somebody with the uh, work of a servant, he will answer it, he will do it like a child. The um, proverb of the tribal people. And uh, therefore, you go out, you, you adjust everything. You say, I know how to do it. And that's what some people do. Teach them on doctrine, teach them on marriage, and tell them, this is how to do this, this is how to do this. Uh, see the marriage committee and go through this, go through this. They say, well, I understand all that. That's good for the ignorant people. Now, if I want to pay dowry now, I will go and text some people. I want to pay dowry. Let them go with me. Why are they going with me? The people who are not sure about themselves, who maybe they will, if you don't watch them, they'll be given alcohol, they'll be given this. They can call people to go with them. But me, since I'm a Christian, I'm even old enough to be a pastor myself now. Everything, when somebody is preaching, I know when they are right, I know when they are wrong. Somebody will now go and follow me to pay dowry. Ah, ah, not me. I've passed that stage now. That's why they fail. They cannot carry out the instruction of the word of God as it is given out. They are too intelligent. And it is our intelligence that makes us to fail. The people that are not intelligent, you watch them, they always succeed on the work of God. Because they are following the blueprint. They are following the master plan coming from the master planner. Here is what we've learned from all these people that we have studied from, that they did everything according to the word of the Lord. Look at Exodus 39, verse 42. According to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel made all the work. That's another stage. 
And that's another thing we need to understand in leadership. All these other people that were working under Moses, can I remind you that some of them were filled with the Spirit of God? Very much. Look at Exodus chapter 31, from verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bazaliel, the son of Purai, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, in all manner of workmanship. And yet, remember what I've read to you now in Exodus 39, 42. According to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did all the work. You see, the problem we have with some people is that they say they have been filled with the Spirit of God. They have been filled with the Spirit of wisdom, of understanding, of knowledge, in all manner of Christian service. They have been saved. They have been sanctified. They have been baptized in the Holy Ghost. And then you put them among the prayer warriors. And you tell them now, pray for people in need. But this is the word of God. This is how we pray. Why don't they leave us to do what the Spirit of God will tell us to do? I am saved. I am sanctified. I am baptized in the Holy Ghost. And these people, they don't realize that even before I became a Christian, in the children and seraphim church we can fast seven days we can be on the mountain not dry fast no water no food nothing and that time even though we were not born again even at that time if any witch or wizard was passing like this we recognize them we had the gift of discernment even before they were born again they had all those things now that by the grace of god have become born again and I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost now. And I'm among the prayer warriors. They don't allow me to deal with those witches and wizards. And I recognize them. If I stand up like this, and they are just passing, I can, I've, been, I've known that before I was born again. That's what they say. They won't allow us to teach them. They say they can do all that. They say when it comes to casting out devils, <laughs> if those people will go and check up my history at uh, the children and seraphim, where I came from, they will know that those people, once I stand like this and I question them and I look at their face directly and I command them and I say talk, talk and I, you know, excite them to begin to talk, they confess everything they have. Something we have been doing before we became born again. Now we came to deeper life. They tell us, pray this way, pray this way, close your eye, bow your head before you pray. I do, we know how to do it already. That's why they fail. But look at this man here. Filled with the spirit of God. Filled with the spirit of knowledge and of wisdom and of understanding. And yet, everything he did, he did according as Moses had commanded them. Moses received from the Lord. He gave it unto them. We'll become more successful when we can pay attention. When we can say, well, I don't know enough. I'm willing to be taught. I will not go my own way. Look at 2 Timothy, chapter 2, and verse 2. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 2. And he thinks that thou hast said of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. The things you, that thou hast heard of me. Timothy, don't modify, don't change. Don't say days should teach knowledge. Don't say the multitude of years should grant you experience. Remember, Timothy, great men are not always wise. Neither do the aged understand judgment. Therefore, just take the word of God. And these things you have heard of me, among many other witnesses, the same thing without editing, without modifying, without adding, without subtracting, the same thing you'll commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So then, to be able to lead in the church, the kingdom life style leadership demands that we'll be obedient to God, to his word, and to the leadership in the church. So that you're not going your own way, 
you are not just doing what you like, but you are following after the footsteps of the master. Number two, there must be an intimate relationship with the Lord through prayer and consecration. An intimate relationship with the Lord through prayer and consecration. There are some people that instead of keeping an intimate relationship with the Lord, they allow their prayer life to dry up. Either they talk too much, or they get so busy they have no time for prayer, or they feel that they can do everything they are doing the energy of the flesh, and it depends upon the arms of the flesh. They see some so-called uh, people that are successful and they don't pray a lot, and they feel that there is a reservoir of the power of God within them, and therefore they can keep on operating without necessarily really praying. And such people will fail miserably. Numbers chapter 12. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Moses was a man of prayer, a man that was given to God, a man that was consecrated and yielded unto the Lord. Every time there was problem in Israel, he will go to the Lord in prayer. He will seek the face of the Lord in prayer. Again, there's a great challenge to us. That Moses, at this time we're reading about, was not a novice in the way of the Lord and the things of the Lord. From the time the Lord called him from the backside of the desert, miracles had been performed. All through the time that he came to Egypt and he appeared before Pharaoh, miracles were being performed every time on a continuous basis. You are talking about a person that most of the time never had any failure in getting his prayer through, whatever he prayed about. When you think about a man who brought water out of the rock, who divided the Red Sea, and who had been used of God mightily so that they could receive all the things they received from the Lord, then you know that this was a man that was already an accomplished man. He accomplished something. And yet, God testified about him. With him will I speak face to face, mouth to mouth. He kept on a relationship with the Lord, intimate relationship with the Lord. And he always prayed, which teaches us a lesson that if we are going to be successful in the work of the Lord, we must give ourselves to prayer and obedience to the word of God. Acts chapter 6, from verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Sometimes we find that leaders pray less than the members in the church. Take for example, a leader wants to get married. And this leader, zonal leader, area leader, whatever, as he wants to get married, he begins to think and uh, he begins to say, well, all the other people can pray and pray a lot because, you know, they are ignorant. But as a zonal leader, he counsels many people. And he knows a lot of the people that are single. You see the other members, their own disadvantage, which is okay for them, is that they do not know the people, they do not know all the people that are single. Therefore, they really have to pray. Because they can easily make a mistake and point at somebody who is already married or engaged. But the zonal leader, he knows the people that are married. He knows those who are already engaged. Even in, the, in another uh, zone, he can easily talk to another zonal leader and uh, without telling that other zonal leader is reason and say, uh, well, I just want to check out because of something going on in a zone connecting your zone. Is uh, so-and-so married or not married? And this other zonal leader will not say, why are you asking as a zonal leader? He will reply, is married, she's married or not married? Therefore, the zonal leader has the disadvantage because of the human knowledge. That one is married, that one is not married, that one is engaged, that one is not engaged, and has been counseling people, 
and has known the people among those that he is counseling that this will be a nice, you know, a nice woman. This one will be, this one will be terrible. Because every time I tell her, do this in the zone, she will argue. That one cannot be a wife. No prayer. You just can know that, that that one cannot be a wife. And that other one, anytime you say area meeting, she's always there. And anytime you say, now, sister, you will do this, sister, you will do this, while the others are frowning, she doesn't know what she says, yes, I will do it. But the man doesn't know that that other lady in the zone that's always saying, yes, I will do it, yes, I will do it, that's her way of selling herself over. But you don't know. And therefore, without any prayer, you just go back to God and you say, well, God, I thank you. Without any prayer already, you are giving me a strong impression. Impression. Everybody can have impression too. Unbelievers have impression. Believers have impression. Those who are praying can have impression. Those who are not praying can have impression. And then goes to the marriage committee. And you know, that's your disadvantage because you are a zonal leader. The marriage committee, who are the people there? Coordinators and zonal leaders and people like them. And then they say, ah, so you have not married zonal leader, have not married, and you have found the will of God now. Uh, yes. Who is that will of God? Is so and so. Uh, is uh, that person married or not? Do you know? Well, you are saying that you ought to know. Is she married? No, not married. Go and tell her. That's the will of God. That's your disadvantage you get into trouble. But the other people, they don't have any knowledge. They are not zonal leader. They don't know who is married, who is not married. They will pray and pray and pray and pray. And then God eventually will lead them. They take a long, long road. They pray, they fast, they pray alone. They call other people, they pray with them. And they go to the marriage committee. When they get to the marriage, they dribble them. They say, how do you know it's the will of God? Suppose that person is married. You say, I know it's the will of God. They say, go and pray again. They pray again. That's better for you. Because you really pray through. Eventually, after about six months, they say, okay, you can go to the sister. And the sister too had been praying. And then eventually, uh, you told the sister. And then the sister went to the marriage committee and said, a hey, brother, uh, this brother saw me and said this and this. How do you know it's the will of God? So anybody will send to you, it's the will of God. Go and pray. And that sister begins to pray again. After three months of prayer, she comes back and says, I never prayed like this before. <laughs> Even when I was getting salvation, I never prayed like this. This prayer is too much. Then they said, what's the answer now? It's the will of God. All right, go and tell him. And eventually they start, they'll have a better marriage. But the other one they didn't allow to pray. Because he has knowledge. That's their downfall. It's better to pray. If something does not allow you to pray, that thing is going to injure you. You see, the apostles, they said, the lifestyle of the leader is that we must give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Prayer. We must pray. It is as you get close with the Lord, intimate with the Lord, that you discover the deep things of the Lord. And so in your life, I must ask you, have you got to the position where all you do now, you just do it with your common sense? You do it with the knowledge that you have. You do it with the experience that you have acquired in the church. No more prayer. As you get up in Christian work, now there are people that can preach. You know, if you have just started preaching in the church, as now I've, given, I've been giving opportunities to some other people uh, to be preaching. If you are called for the first time and you are going to face that large crowd, and you have been told about a week before, oh, you pray. And you pray, God, how will I do it? God, how will I do it? Those are the people that succeed. But the others who have been preaching before, and I just say, brother or sister, you are going to give this message. Oh, praise the Lord. Long time I've been waiting and I've not been called all these few weeks. And I've just seen all these young, young people being called. Now that I'm called, praise the Lord. But no prayer. Well, we can do it. Can't we preach? Can't we talk to the people? Have we not been preaching before? And then we come to the congregation. Nobody gets saved. Nobody is convicted. Nobody is challenged. Nobody is drawn into the depth of the experiences of the Lord. You know why? Because we stop praying. It is by prayer that we can have the victory that we ought to have. Look at your house fellowship. Now let's be sincere. When we started house fellowship, and they chose you as house fellowship leader. And you pleaded with the uh, zonal leader. I said, brother, you know I didn't go to school. 
I will not be able to do this thing. I will not be able to lead us. I know I've been long in the church, but I'm not worried. If you put those other people there, since I know I cannot do it, there is no envy, there is no jealousy in me, I will be in the house. I can be inviting people for the other people to teach them. You know, Sister So-and-So, she is better than 